Before we begin, I would like to give a trigger warning as this is a true crime story involving strong religious tones and the murder of a young child. There is graphic description and images that may be disturbing to some viewers. This video is in no way to make light of the situation that occurred and the young life that was lost. Hey, welcome back to the Playground Halloween Edition. It is me, Angie Lee. This early morning story is of the murder of five-year-old Phoebe Johnchuk, who was thrown from the Dick Meisner Bridge in the early morning hours of January the 8th, 2015, just after midnight, by her otherwise loving father, John Johnchuk Jr. John had psychological issues beginning in early childhood. He was medicated, though no one could tell you why. His parents stopped following up on his mental health when he was 14 years old, and therefore, John was no longer medicated. His mother was a severe alcoholic and drug addict. When John was a child, and when she went to prison, John went to his dad, who passed him around to multiple other relatives before giving him up to the state. When John was 16, his mother was released from prison and he tried to form a relationship with her. She wasn't interested. At the age of 20, John's on and off again girlfriend, Michelle Kerr, gave birth to their daughter, Phoebe, on August 22nd, 2009. Michelle Kerr gave custody to John when she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. When John was 21, he went for help with his mental health. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and tried many different medications to help manage his symptoms. His medication was expensive and he was no longer able to get the refills, so in the months leading up to the murder, he had been trying to stretch out what he had left. In September, he tried to get an antipsychotic prescription refilled, but was unsuccessful. John was given a Bible from his stepmom that had been in the family for years, and he became obsessed with it. When she asked for it back, because of his obsession, he refused to give it back. He started carrying the Bible with him everywhere he went. He says he can hear it knocking and that Phoebe starts chanting when she touches it. He even slept with it under his pillow. He poured salt around the house in large piles and around Phoebe's room. John wasn't sleeping very much in the weeks before the killing. He contacted his uncles, who he hadn't spoken to in years, to tell him the Chinese drywall was making their food taste funny. He texted an ex-friend insistently, telling her that she was possessed and needed help. He says, I found the key to unlock my gift, and I'm going to do everything I can to get him out of there. At 1.30 a.m., on the morning of January 7th, John called St. Paul's Church, trying to arrange for him and Phoebe to be baptized. John asked his mom if Phoebe could stay the night with her, but Phoebe wanted to stay with her dad, and so she did. John's mom noticed that night that Phoebe was wearing a gold cross that she hadn't seen since John himself was a child. At 10 a.m., only 14 hours before John dropped Phoebe off, the Dick Meisner Bridge, John had an appointment with an attorney, which was very, very alarming. I got in, I want to say around 9.30. Um, the phone was ringing when I got, I mean, I, I, and I undid the answering service. I was the first one in. So I undid the answering service and the phone started ringing right away. Um, and it was him on the phone. He uh, said to me he already had came by the office earlier. Um, he, I think he said around nine um, to drop off the, the, the fee that I needed. And he won't talk to me and meet with me too. So I wasn't scheduled with him that day. Um, I did have things that I had to get done, but I told him, well, if you want to come now, I have a little bit of time. Um, I could see you and meet with you now. He was wearing pajama pants. Um, and a hoodie. The way it happened um, is he came up with Phoebe and then, then he 
that little gathering area I had with a tweed chair and a little table, coffee table in the middle, he put his backpack on it. And it was heavy. It looked like it was heavy. Like he just put the backpack, but it looked like it was, you know, it, was, it made a sound when it hit the table. Um, and then Phoebe was just wandering around the loft. You know, she was kind of exploring or looking around. She wasn't very far, but you know, she was just looking around. Um, and then he unzipped his backpack and then took this big brown, as far as I knew, I didn't know what it was at first, so it was a book, but he told me it was a Bible. Um, so he put it on my little black table and actually it was crumbling. Um, I mean, I had, after he left, I still had pieces of the Bible. It was falling apart a little bit. Um, so he put it on the table and he, he explained to me that it was a Bible that was been in his family for quite some time and through his stepmother. Um, and um, that he was fascinated with it at that point. And the first thing that he said that kind of got me a little, made me, feel, made me feel uncomfortable, let's say. I started there. I, I started getting uncomfortable when he, he, he told me that when Phoebe touches the Bible, when Phoebe puts her hand on the Bible, um, that she start chanting, um, like singing, like, you know, you use the word chant, she start chanting. Um, and he was telling me about that, like how, you know, at night or at home, like, you know, she'll touch the Bible and she'll start chanting. And I, I had a feeling that he was going to go with, let me tell, let me show you. Like, I feel he was going to go there, like he was going to ask Phoebe to touch the Bible. He didn't, he did it, but the conversation was like heading towards, like I felt this is what he was going to do. So I kind of put a stop to the conversation and I asked if it was okay if Phoebe would go back downstairs with my paralegal and then I had crayons and papers, coloring book, and she could just draw, you know, while we talk because I, I just, I, it made me feel uncomfortable. Well, then I closed the door, and then I, I, um, <clears throat> I start talking about the paperwork. You know, I start talking about, you ready to move forward? And at that point, he kind of, he was not really interested into talking about the paternity case, it was the, the paperwork. He wasn't interested in that. He, um, he said, you know, that's going to sound weird um, or strange. He said, weird or strange, I'm not, one of those words. He said, that sounds weird. But I really think that, um, I think you're St. Genevieve. And it caught me off guard clearly. So I kind of said, um, I was like, no, you know, I'm definitely not. Uh, he's like, no, 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 you're St. Genevieve. I know you are. Um, you just came back from the city of Babylon, which was Montreal. Um, to him was Babylon. So, so I said, um, I, I insisted that I wasn't. And then he said from there, well, then if you're not St. Genevieve, then you must be God. And that led then the conversation, and he was serious. Like, it wasn't like, it wasn't, he wasn't joking around at that point. Like, he was, his tone changed. And then he was serious. He was like, you're God, you're a creator. Uh, and I said, no, and I'm definitely not God. And I was starting to be a little, not, at that point I knew something was not right. And it's starting to make me feel really nervous. And I started thinking, okay, where do I go from here? How do I get him back on track to just talk about the papers and then get him out of here, right? Um, then he insisted that I read the Bible to him. And I said, I can't. You said earlier that it was in Swedish. I don't speak Swedish. I can't read his Bible. I can't. I'm not going to, John. And then he said, you are the creator. You speak all languages. You know how to speak Swedish. And, I, and he was, it wasn't, it wasn't joking. Like he was, I was starting getting like very, very nervous. And then I keep saying, no, 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 sorry. He insisted that I read the Bible to him in Swedish. And I said, I, I wouldn't do it for him. And I couldn't anyway, because I didn't speak the language. He kept insisting and insisting and insisting. And every time that I said no, I could tell that he was getting more agitated and more upset. And it was almost like it didn't make sense to him that I didn't. Like, it, it's, whatever 
theory he had in his mind, whatever he was thinking, all of a sudden I was like kind of telling him that like it couldn't be. So he was getting frustrated with the idea that I wasn't what he said I was. Um, so I went back and forth like that for a while. And I keep trying to get him back to the paperwork. Um, at one point, um, when he when he got, you know, tired of me saying that I was not going to read the Bible and that I was not God, eventually he just said, "Then, then I'm God. I must be God." And then that that scared me a lot because I'm thinking I'm upstairs by myself, the door's closed, I'm in a loft, now he's getting frustrated, not aggressive, but he didn't, he didn't do anything where he threw things around, but he was getting upset, angry, and now he thinks he's God, and I'm by myself with him, you know, and so, um, so I, um, one thing that he did say, um, when he was insisting that I read the Bible to him is that I need you to read this to me um, because I need to reinstate my faith in mankind. He did talk about um, an angel was coming, um, an angel named Michael was coming down sometime soon. And that's at that point that I looked up at a clock right on the wall on, in front of, behind him on the wall, and it was 10.40. And sometime in that conversation back and forth, he told me that he was going to, he and Phoebe were going to go get baptized. Um, he had made an appointment at St. Paul Catholic Church on Del Mabry for him and Phoebe to get baptized at 11 o'clock that morning. Um, it was 1040 when I look at the clock. So I, as soon as I saw that, I said, that was my way out. That was my, you know, that's the way I'm going to get him out of here. So I said, John. I said, it's 1040, you know, you told me you had an appointment at 11, I think you need to get going. And you're going to miss your appointment if you don't go. You need to go now because I'm about 15 minutes away from the church. So if you leave now, you still can make your appointment. So you don't want to miss that. So I convinced him to wrap up and then get his, you know, things back and leave. Um, so he said, yes, you're right. Um, yeah, I, I need to go there. And then as is, he was trying to pack up his Bible back in his backpack. Um, I helped him. I mean, I helped him zip the backpack. I don't want him out. So um, I helped him zip the backpack, and in the and, and, and shuffle of the thing, he said, um, can you drive me there? And I said, I said, no. I No, John, I can't drive you there. Um, I got appointments. I mean, I have, you know, I took, I mean, I, I can't drive you there. And then, is there a reason why you want me to drive you there? Did you drink alcohol? Did you take drugs? Do you have any reason why you can't drive? You drove here. And he said, no, 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 I'm, there's no reason I can't drive. Um, I said, okay. And I said, um, can I leave Phoebe here? And I, I said, y she's going to get baptized with you, isn't she? He's like, yeah. I was like, well, he, he, she can't be baptized with you if she's going to leave her here. You have, you know, you, you got to take her. And I'm, I'm thinking, like, you know, you can't leave your child. It didn't make it, to me. It didn't make sense. Like I, I was trying to get him out, but I'm thinking in my head, I'm gonna call 911 as soon as he's out. So, you know, so I'll, I'll have him. I'll have the police on his way, on, on the way to catch up with him. Um, and he said, "You're right. You're right. I gotta take Phoebe um, to get baptized." And um, so then I'm sitting down still on my. I sat back down in my chair. And I had the paperwork that I had prepared still mm -hmm. that we barely talked about. And I said, what do you want me to do with the paperwork? Um, you know, I still need the filing fee uh, from you. Um, what do I do? And he, he was standing up um, at that point. I was sitting down. So it was kind of like he was looking down at me. And he got, ser like he got serious again. Like he kind of got this serious look on his face. And he, he kind of looked down. He said, none of this is going to matter tomorrow. And I, when he said that, then I, I was thinking in my head, oh my God, what is he going to do? And I told my assistant, call 911, I'm going to grab it, phone upstairs. And then she did. John arrived at St. Paul's just after 11 a.m., demanding an exorcism and to be baptized. Officers came to the church after the lawyer called, 
to Baker Act interview with him. They saw no immediate threat, and so they left. After being told he could not get the exorcism and baptism that day, he left St. Paul's and was at St. Lawrence Church by noon, also demanding an exorcism and baptism for him and Phoebe. He tells the Reverend that he sees the devil, and the Reverend directs him to another church. John is at St. Magdalene, with not only Phoebe, but also his stepmother until this time, convinced that he needs to show Father Bill that she was still alive. Again, he demanded to be baptized, and he demanded exorcism that day. And again, he was told that that was not the way that it works, and so he left. Just before midnight on the night of January 7th, Officer William Vickers is on his way home after his shift. He is still in his marked cruiser and uniform when a white PT cruiser passes him on the Dick Meisner Bridge, going at least 100 an hour. Thinking the car may be stolen, Officer Vickers doesn't conduct a traffic stop but begins to call it in when the PT cruiser suddenly stops on the side of the bridge. Officer Vickers, could you step to the screen and point to where the white PT cruiser was when this occurred? Would have been roughly here. What do we see in this photograph? The water and the protective bumpers for the supports of the bridge. Was this the view that you had when you looked over the edge of the bridge, looking in the water for Phoebe? It is. John exits the car with the large Bible in his hand. Officer Vickers draws his weapon and shouts to John, Stop where you are. Don't move. John continues around the back of the car, looks at Officer Vickers and says, You have no free will. He continues around the car, opens the passenger door and pulls out a small child who had seemingly just been awoken. In one swift move, he turns and drops her off the bridge. Phoebe screams on the way down. John gets back in the car and slowly drives away while Officer Vickers goes down the nearby ladder in search of the girl. Is that the ladder that you used to go to the bottom of the bridge? It is. What do we see in this photograph? The water and the protective bumpers for the supports of the bridge. Was this the view that you had when you looked over the edge of the bridge, looking in the water for Phoebe? It is. John gets to the toll booth, and because there are vehicles in line, he backs up and speeds through an empty toll. Is that the white PT Cruiser? Backing out of lane two, yes sir. those the cones you were referring to that he drove over? Yes, sir. Is this lane two with the white van? Yes. Is that your lane and your booth? Yes. Do you know how many other vehicles were in the line when the white PT cruiser <coughs> pulled up? At least two. John was stopped by a police barricade which exploded his tires. Multiple officers with guns drawn yelling at John to exit the vehicle. However, John stays in the car, staring straight ahead with his hands gripping the steering wheel. The officers smashed the windows and still, he didn't even flinch. He stayed still and he was pulled out of the car. He didn't struggle. He was dead weight. In the back of the police car, John asks for his Bible. He demands to be taken to Babylon. He says, I am God, and you shall address me as such. Here are some of the clips from the interviews 
withdrawn in the hours after his arrest. I went looking for answers. I've always had problems growing up, like wondering who I was and how and what my purpose was. How do you know all this stuff? I mean, you told me when I was asking you what your name was and what your, you said that you worked at Island Crew. Is Phoebe okay? Phoebe? Who's that? many times where Phoebe was and why he couldn't see her. It wasn't until May that they told him what had happened. Well, for the first um, several weeks, probably going into two months, 
he would constantly ask, where is she? Um, how is she doing? Why can't I talk with her? And so we would give vague answers because we didn't feel like at that point he was ready um, for us to give him the whole picture because he was having so many symptoms and we needed to focus on those first. The team decided together that um, his symptoms were controlled enough on the medication to tell him exactly what happened. So uh, that's my role as the counselor to do that. We were afraid of how he would respond because he had had some incidents where he was aggressive. So we had security um, escort us there. They were kind of on the perimeter and I sat on the picnic table and I told him um, that she had passed away from an incident that he was involved in where he dropped her off a bridge. And he, he was crying first and I expected that, but then after some point he, he became like, no emotion, um, numb, shock, something like that, and then um, asked to go to his room. So we allowed him to go back and just monitored him, and he was like that for several days. It took four years for John to be found competent for trial. So we know John was guilty. But do you think that he was guilty by reason of insanity? I was very invested with the trial when the trial was happening and I was watching it every day. To be honest, I was shocked with the verdict. What about you? I never would have guessed he would have done such a thing to his own baby girl still new. Phoebe's spirit. She was so lovable. He was definitely a Jekyll and Hyde. He was a demon. I felt that, like a devil. Thank you so much for watching and we will catch you in the next video. Bye for now. Love you.